the stage. A good example here for our first speaker. And I will wave my hand or wave my finger for one minute. I will shake it like this for zero. Okay, so um, the first speaker is uh, Benedict Letelier, The Need for a Transdisciplinary Approach in Comparative Literature. She goes from the Université de la Réunion, La Réunion en France. Good morning, everybody. This short presentation will focus on the relevance of being transdisciplinary in comparative literature. I think literary criticism does not sufficiently take into account the results of science, or at least its questions and debates related to the definitions of reality and of the real. But to my mind, the following important question should guide any research. How far can we agree that observed reality is the same thing as reality as it really is? In literature, we study realism, fictions, the virtual, the imaginary, that is to say, any representation considered as unreal. Therefore, literature is still stigmatized as a false copy of the world that is not the real, as a mimetic practice, as a document that reflects the evolution of societies and, in, in the best case, as an art that can predict a few rare events. But for me, literature cannot be reduced to these characteristics. We must also consider literature as a science of reality, because words are the first incarnations of thought and the first material of thinking the world. We must compare literary choices, uh, literary theories and thoughts, literary discourses and representations with other scientific ones. As Bessarab Nicolescu puts it in his book, What Reality Is, the word reality is one of the most corrupt words of all the languages of the world. We all believe we know what reality is, but if we are asked, we discover that there are as many meanings of this word as there are inhabitants on earth. It is not surprising, therefore, that countless conflicts continually engage individuals and peoples. Reality against reality. I totally agree with his assertion. Moreover, I think that literature is a laboratory of experiences and that it can transform the world, which in turn transforms us. Take the case of poetry. What does poetry reveal to science? Just as scientists, scientists use poetic metaphors to describe phenomena, I will use physical phenomena to illustrate what poetry is and what it reveals. If we imagine poetry as a source of light, a poem can be perceived as a form that both hides and suggests light. And any form of this word hides and such is light. Thus, the content of poetry is hidden by the form of the poem, which may therefore appear or children hermetic. This signals what I call the eclipse of poetry, especially in our societies, and what I'll be mentioning calls the erasure of the subject of the poem. So imagine that you are in this picture, that you observe the light from the point of view of the earth. And imagine that your gaze focuses on the object and on the light. It hides and suggests. You will attend to an eclipse and you will not see the light directly the source. The meaning of the poem viewed suddenly has a set of images, rhymes and figures of speech, the meaning of which is often enigmatic is thus hidden from the common reader. Indeed, very few people like to read poetry in our societies especially. 
Actually, this perception is a cultural apprehension of poetry which absolutizes the poem and arises its subject, its source. I suggest, I think, that the aesthetic objectivation of the poem is one of the rhetorical answers of poets and critics faced with accusations of poetry's uselessness and is an attempt to legitimize poetry and literature in relation to, to, sorry, to our intellectual activities and productions. But the poem is neither the projected image or nor even the light projected on a screen. It is neither the observed object nor even the observer. As the French poet Liebig wrote in his poem, Pyramids, we figure, after all, have only a real merit. It is to simplify the world, to be a dream it gave itself. Geometrical figures such as pyramids or figures of speech like prosopopoeia, in which pyramids are personified, result from a rational process of simplification and from imagination. First, the simplification represents a structure of space. Then the poet imagines the subjectivity of the geometrical object, which implies both its singularity and its generality. The poem cannot truly delete the subject in the representation of the world, otherwise it is not a poem. The, this means that the subject of the poem solves many paradoxes thanks to its capacity to reconcile two different representations by imagination or thought and to make the invisible perceptible through sensations or analogies. In other words, the poem formulates an adventure of consciousness which collapses the subject-object separation. On this diagram, very often used by Gustav Nicolescu, the cylinder represents the hidden fruit, which is the reconciliation between the subject and object, and in the same way, poem represents like the cylinder, the hidden pearl. Actually, whatever the form of the poem, of the poem, poetry reveals the existence of what Pastor Nicolescu calls the, the hidden pearl. Recently, in a paper entitled The Poetic Conjunction of the Words, a New Grammar or Thought, I show that poetry is the zone of non-resistance. Poetry as such is the very best weapon against dualistic and conflictual thought. Uh, in other words, poetry helps us to create a new grammar of thought that suggests new links between words or levels of reality. That is to say, a transdisciplinary thinking and a new manner of experiencing the real and a new way of loving. <laughs> as Pastor Nicolescu said in his book, The Hidden Fur, Poetry is the highest quantum approach in the world. Quantum mechanics depicts the mechanics of the universe, whereas poetry reveals its dynamic secret. The diagram on the right, which I borrow from Masara Nicolescu, shows another representation of the hidden verb that challenged me because it made me think about the representation of a, a tourist um, and its torrido flow. According to Nassim Harabain, all things are feeding information to the vacuum and the vacuum is feeding it back. The amount you are, that you are able to feed into the system is related directly to your amount of resistance and how much information can come in. If poetry is the zone of non-resistance, the amount of information the poem exchanges with the vacuum is infinite. And this is made possible by its specific use of language and its peculiar gait of spirit. One of my favorite poets, Walt Whitman, depicts this, this secret dynamic of the hidden world in his lines. The fluid vacuum around the head, still entering and dividing. No book returning, no anchor anchoring, no rock striking, swift, glad, content, unbelieved, nothing, losing of all able and ready at any time to give strict account. The divine, she says, the divine seed. The poem 
is indeed the zone of non-resistance, symbolized by the dipping of I see. These conditions require unconditional love, or in other words, the capacity to talk with ourselves, to imagine a new world. That's why I uh, totally agree with the equation formulated by Bessaham Nicolescu. <laughs> Science plus love gives us poetry. Thank you very much.
uh, in, in the, this, this microfield of science technology, there are movement of discipline, interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary to, to transdiscipline discourse analysis, say of the of culture. And I don't know if you understand that. Um, discipline fields, semiotics and linguistics, um, in, in, in the first, and then um, um, after interdisciplinary fields, ethnolinguistics, sociolinguistics, psycholinguistics, philosophy of language, the first delivery, and the second delivery, ethnographic of communication, linguistics and pragmatics, discourse analysis, semiotics of translation. In this um, discourse analysis and semiotics of culture, it is where it's where more my word. It's going to start a transdisciplinary <laughs> In the, the between discourse analysis and semiotic of culture, there is um, where it's possible to, to construct the transdisciplinary um, point of view. Uh, third nucleus from complexity and transdisciplinary we have worked on um, the discourse semiotic practice category, the culture, counterculture, anti-culture category, the transdisciplinary complex subject category, the transdisciplinary complex meaning category, the discourse semiotic condition of production, circulation and reception, the discursive semiotic materialities, discursive semiotic argumentation category, the category of aesthetics and art, the category of the visual, post-visual, in this people, in the in that. The discursive semiotic materialities and, and, and the point of view of transdisciplinarity is this materiality, acoustics, visual, smell, taste, touch, communicative, pragmatic, ideological, of power, cultural, historical, social, cognitive, simulacrum, psychology, psychoanalytical, <laughs> the aesthetic rhetoric and the philosophical logic. These materialities is in this, in this <laughs> diagram in Spanish. In the disciplinary discourse system of model, it's very difficult because um, I use um, very much dependence of the communication of pragmatic, of linguistic, of uh, political, of uh, all the materialities um, to type, typology of, um, of discourse and semantics over uh, condition, um, production, reception, circulation and materialities and, and function in, 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 uh, 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 with the theory of complex subjects. Subject. Mm, uh, that Vasari and Bolesco subject the transdisciplinarity subject and the object is transdisciplinarity. Mm, this is the uh, own complexus quantum two. For the all um, social science, science because um, um, is the, the subject in the own complexus um, with the contradiction, with, with very much ideology, with very much uh, culture, is the, 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 the own complexus in the global world. And a lot is very important. This, the, if you want, I send all of all this this <laughs> And thank you, the student group of complexity and the transitory. This is the art, the rhetoric of the spiritual loop of complexity and the transitory. Okay, 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 I, I don't know. See, yes. This is very 
quote from John Muir, and it says, the clearest way to the universe is through a forest wilderness. Two nights ago, I was in the Hoya Basu forest, which is a haunted forest here in Transylvania, looking for the universe. I did not see any UFOs. For those of you who know about the forest, some people have said they see UFOs in this forest. <clears throat> but the fact is that forests are very inspiring, and uh, the forest that I will show you is the Redwood Forest in California, as I tell you the story of the tree doctor. So uh, this is uh, from a mountain near the, the forest, and it tells us that trees uh, gravitate to light, phototropism, and to gravity, geotropism. So the notion that trees are very connecting between Father Sky and Mother Earth is one of the reasons I celebrate them as metaphors of connection, as metaphors of uh, uh, of joining things together um, in uh, creative uh, and important ways. And you will know, uh, whatever language you speak, that we speak all the time of trees of life or trees of knowledge. Trees have been very important to us to organize the way we think about things. For example, as they, as they climb to the sky, we talk about branches of knowledge or maybe new branches to explore uh, enlightenment, light in different ways. There is a uh, expression that we use in English and probably in other language that one of the problems for human beings is they cannot see the forest for the trees. It means we only see isolated things and we don't see the big picture. Again, I believe this is a transdisciplinary metaphor of connection. But the trees are have a life that we cannot see. Some of you will be aware of Peter uh, Wollenbend's book from Germany called The Hidden Life of Trees, which says that underneath the trees are communicating with each other. They are communicating with mushrooms and with fungi. And they actually support each other and communicate each other <coughs> and, and communicate with other species. So trees under the ground ask us to understand our own roots, our own connections that we make uh, between ourselves and other species. When you are the chairman and your watch goes to sleep, you have to look and say, okay, almost three minutes, good. Uh, trees are bridges. Uh, they, they give us bridges, but they also, as I said before, connect uh, the, 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 uh, the hidden life with the, uh, the life uh, uh, in, uh, in the light. The uh, trunk of trees are the major connectors. And here I want to mention another book and let us celebrate the fact that trees give us books, right, paper. Eduardo Cohen wrote a book after studying the Runa people in Ecuador. The title of the book says it all. It says how forests think. So to our conversation about consciousness, I am here presenting myself as an embodied conscious tree character. But the notion, the, the, the subtitle of that book is Towards an Anthropology Beyond the Human. So I think as the chair of the Human Sciences session, we must be very careful that we include other living creatures in our human sciences. This reminds me of a book by Robert Harrison called Forests, the Shadows of Civilization. Every story from Gilgamesh to Romulus and Remus to the Indian narratives, the mythologies, talk about our primitive relationships to forests. We emerged from forests. And forests have always and will continue to be a point of conversation between our civilizations and nature, in my opinion. Trees tell us about the topic of the next talk, aging and death, and how they can help us think long term as oldest trees in the world are thousands of years old. 
But let me end by bringing you home. This is my own arboretum. This is the arboretum in Cleveland, near where I live. And trees remind us of the seasons as they go from the spring to the fall. And here is uh, me <clears throat> at a celebration of trees, all about storytelling. So this is what the tree doctor does. And in our intergenerational schools, our children from 5 to 15 interview elders in the community about what they have done to save the community, to help the community. So the nature center that I just showed you would have been destroyed by a politician who wanted to put a freeway right through that uh, nature center. So this we call passing activism across the generation. So this is the transdisciplinary impulse to take action. And here is in Canada, children from inner city Cleveland are meeting with elders from Toronto in another arboretum to work on a legacy project called U177. Young, old, united, one planet, seven billion people, seven generations. And so I have one second left. So I will show you a picture of me reading the book that comes from the Legacy Project called Dreams about our responsibilities for each other and nature over time. So that is my granddaughter. Uh, so I will end with that subjective moment. Thank you.
we must acknowledge the non coincidence between our method and our truth because, one, first, truth, of course, platonic meanings are excluded, escapes any big center structure, it, always, it is always deeper in the dynamic process of signification, and second, methods are imperfect instruments of triggering and understanding that often undermines exactly these instruments, shattering their logic that they still partially use due to historical determinations of any language, which makes impossible pure novelty and total disruption. The sociologization of old age determines the shadowing of non-social meanings of old age. Ontological and phenomenological perspectives on aging are made irrelevant because not even addressed. The major risk is imposing over pacified, if not ideological, feelings concerning aging. The sociologization of old age is widespread in social sciences and also in humanities. Forms of sociologization of old age are to be found especially in theories of successful aging or in sociological approaches that are based on this paradigm, in sociological investigations and inter interventionist projects that focus on ageism and the fashionable idea of social inclusion of the elders in the studies in the transhumanist movement. Due to time limitation, I will um, discuss only some aspects. Theories of successful aging. What characterizes um, current theories of successful aging is an homogeneous language and an extremely coherent network of ideas. The state is to increase both the quality and the quantity of life for the elders. The premise of successful aging is that a good life is an active life understood as depending on a physical and psychological health and on a rich social life. According to this vision, an active aging is correlated with a bigger self esteem of the elders which this way can substantially contribute to society and avoid the risk of social <coughs> exclusion. <coughs> aging entails the dialectical relationship between accepting the reality of old age and uh, fighting or denying it. Nevertheless, it is an un unbalanced dialectics because the first term, the acceptance, is, is weaker than the second one. Its sole purpose being to trigger the perpetual fight. Sometimes successful aging is regarded as transdisciplinarity due to its certain multi-perspectivism. Uh, although still in fashion, successful aging has received strong criticism, especially regarding its liberal capitalist roots. One has to consume in order to be able to fight. A high social and financial, financial status is needed for eating healthy, referring to aesthetic medicine procedures or, or exercising, but also concerning its inability to cope with mortality. In fact, what critical approaches uh, touch uh, without naming as such is the sociologization of old age. Our aging actively is transformed into a set of norms. It requires social implementation. It has a social solution. At a personal level, from a style among others of aging, it is expanded into an individual problem. The success of aging well is thus correlated with the individual effort of maintaining an active style of life. Old age suffers a similar process of meaning narrowing as communication does. Uh, good aging is always an active one, as a good or efficient communication is always shaped by extroversion. Mm, one of the risks of these successful aging narratives is to cast an exclusive positive light on, on old age. Age is just a number, but the reality plays to these words. Test it, age is never just a number. Eradic eradicating fear of old age, rejection because of age is personal discomfort due to how others Judge based on the numbers of the days you live in this world is extraordinary and noble in intention. But scholars, gerontologists, and other professionals related to old age have to acknowledge that this is not only possible, but it would be facetious as well to believe it can be really done. Successful aging and other similar approaches affect the socially constructed nature of aging, believing the contemporary constructs reduce the social empowerment of the elders, prescribing to them only passive roles and promoting social disengagement. The narrow view um, on what social constructions mean and the arguments are the following. First, um, recognizing the social nature of reality does not make it easier to modify. Social means more than a set of meanings on which one can simply intervene by rearranging them in the right order. Um, changing the language may change the reality, but not suddenly, and not always predictably. Language needs its own time to change, otherwise it is all a matter of discursive mess, on us, an aspect on which politically correct apostles should reflect on, not discussing about how things are, but about how they should be, suppose forcing both language and reality on them, uh, and indicates the risk of idealization and, of course, ideologization. Uh, the, so the sociologization of old age is revealed uh, itself as a cultural construct by, 
philosopher Jean Amélie. He contests both the mode and the type of emerging form of successful aging, um, with its imperative of leaving old age as a second youth and the classic form according to which one uh, age comes, uh, I, one with which old age comes ideologically, with self reconciliation and peace, opposing to them the right to rebellion, the lack of enthusiasm, and to even uh, the right to hate old age. Um, a first critique of stereotypes. Uh, it is true that any discourse involves its will of truth, as we say, critic discourses also face the risk of favoring certain meanings over others. Here is an example. And the idea is that um, uh, the reduction of the personal level to the social one, in this example, okay, um, no matter how successful our society would be in making world a better place for the elders, preoccupation with one one's future as old will still be normal if understood as translating uh, an existential personal anxiety aroused by entering effectively or imaginary an age of great transformations as uncertain sentences. Okay, as uh, Andrew Irving says, the social is not foundational and does not form the ground of all being. The reduction of the literary level to the social level representation does not function in the same way in society and in literature. Literary representation does not, does not mean simply reducing reality, even when, as in the case of realism, it seems to emulate it. Literature reshapes, reorganizes reality. Thus, literary stereotypes differ from literary, uh, from social stereotypes. Okay, so now we go to the, the second trend, the aestheticization of, uh, of, um, of old age. Um, accepting, um, if there is a lesson in sociologization, that, it, that is that accepting and improving aging is not reducible to sociologization, understood as equating social methods with research tools. But this applies also to other sciences, uh, be them humanities, humanities or social sciences that proceed in the same way, this time equating aesthetical methods with research tools. Generally speaking, okay, it is obvious that focusing entirely on literary and artistic representations from an over aestheticized perspective in establishing the right portrait of old age as a portrait with all the nuances are possible and acceptable, a sort of multiculturalism of aging, incurs the risk of ignoring the need for social and political interventions. For example, in order to stimulate the social inclusion of those who over a certain age become invisible and thus extremely vulnerable. Uh, to counteract this, uh, the limitation of one discipline, researchers use the study of life narratives, combining methods of literary studies and sociology, initiating, among, among others, by the William Grant. But I don't have too much time to discuss about it. So I will go with the last part. So the, the incompleteness of research findings on uh, old age, the monologues of disciplines uh, who, who um, tend to ignore each other, the whole dialogue between the, the disciplines and the tendency to borrow uh, each other's methodologies rather instrumentally without acknowledging the whole consequence in the disorder they introduce in the system when adopted, neglecting the complexity of reality and the fact that truth can function only locally in accordance with the logics of, uh, of their theoretical framework, are only a few of the aspects that make necessary the transparency of logic on eating and on the exchange.
today, changing nothing but our opinions, or we could say our attitude, a cultural engagement with the much sought after goals of metaphysics would mean adapting our neural perceptions, whereby the process of the release of information conserved in phenomena is expressed through the proactive transdisciplinary instincts of science, art, and religion. Co-evolutionary phylogenetic principles of human brain and autonomic nervous system functioning are essential for individuals and cultural institutions to experientially evolve so that normative levels of being may be raised. I make the argument in my dissertation, which was published in 2016 from the University of California, that only did transdisciplinarity's triad model synthesizes autonomic cognitive forces within homo sapiens biological organization, will it successfully relate, raise all three levels of reality, which being transdisciplinary entails. Within the contemporary meaning of evolution and transdisciplinary becoming, the finer qualities of human awareness and perception are embraced. This is obvious, I think. Touchstones go back to the pre-Socratics. While this quality of intuitive examination remains preserved in Eastern sacred texts and traditions, self-knowledge in Western traditional education and society was largely lost to the common era. So I'm just making a fast jump now to my main evidence. The vagus nerve, how many of you are familiar with the vagus nerve? Not many. Uh, the tenth cranial nerve, it's here, the lower of the brain. It's called the wandering nerve because it extends from the brain stem to the abdomen's digestive system. It influences your digestive system, your reproductive system, your endocrine, your cardiovascular, neurological, and the ability of your body to repair itself during sleep. If you follow the yellow line, you'll see that it, all the organs that it engages. Since the vagus nerve's biological function is to regulate the human and autonomic nervous system, ANS, it's predictable, dynamic, Sensory pathway will necessarily become a core focus within transdisciplinary research and experiential learning practices. In his hand drawn book on anatomy, anatomy, Da Vinci drew the reversive nerve as it was known in his day. How did we miss this? <laughs> uh, and he wrote, if the heart's motion comes from the reversive nerves, which have the, their origin in the brain, then you will clarify how the soul, animal spirits, have their own origin in the left ventricle of the heart. So you should attend well to these reversive nerves, and likewise to other nerves, because the motion of all the muscles arise from these nerves, which their branches are diffused through the muscles. This is our our own tree that lives inside each one of us. Today, on the side of empirical evidence, four key 19th, 20th, and 21st figures have effectively recalibrated human biological and evolutionary understanding, where higher normative levels of consciousness are experientially verifiable. These are the four. I'll introduce them only very briefly. Hewlings Jackson, Paul McLean, Stephen Porges, and G.I. Gurdjieff. Following Charles Darwin's work, Hewlings <coughs> Jackson developed his theory of dissolution. In his 1884 lectures, he stated the higher nervous system arrangements inhibit or control the lower. And thus, when the higher are suddenly rendered functionless, the lower rise in activity. And when I'm, I'm going to use this word higher and lower now till the end of the talk, higher simply means above the diaphragm and lower.
lower, at least below the diaphragm. So we're not talking about esoteric necessarily, higher uh, knowledge or higher, but it does reflect a very similar parallel. So here is Hewlett Jackson's diagram with his statement above, and you see that there is not just a dual sympathetic and parasympathetic system, but a third. Whether or not this is our hidden third, in reality, uh, I'll leave it to all of us to come to some conclusion about this, but I um, always was taught about the fight-flight system as a dual system, and in fact there is a third. Following Darwin and Jackson is Paul McLean, derived his uh, triune brain neurology in 1966. This is his expression of the evolution of the brain from reptile, early mammal, to man. Nested hierarchies. These earlier evolutionary understandings of the vagus nerve function was then uh, adapted or advanced by Borges in 1994 with his public vagal theory. I recommend that anyone interested in this topic purchase this book. Borges research provides a new model for comprehending the natural complexity of human behavior. Portis shows that humans not only carry a more recent, higher myelinated sensory apparatus, but for it to function normally, it relies on vagal tone. How our bodies make decisions given various challenges are phylogenetically based in the ANS circuitry. Our ANS functions predictably uh, function predictably where a newer circuit may inhibit earlier only if the two lower components are not recruited for defense. The tone of the vagus nerve regulates the activation of the parasympathetic <coughs> nervous system associated with rest, relaxation, and digestion. The VVC signal system for motion and emotion and communication that supports and advances cortical development. When possible to access, integration of the whole ANS rather than defaulting to the older two-way system. Here is the addition third, the VVC, and you'll see that it's a signaling system, and I'm saying that this is also a sign semiotically in the, through the pineal gland. I will move on. This is the three-way, while the earlier lower two circuits are related to associative patterns of emotion, and limited to a reflexive dynamic between voluntary and involuntary actions. The third, newer potential, newer in terms of evolution of our neocortex, uh, represents a reconciling force. This model deserves considerable thought within our Congress as to the implications in relation to all aspects of human life. It outdates the previous model and Goethe, who is very important in this, in his deathbed wrote that we must teach our organs. This comes from a question about how we came to his conclusions as house. And experiential practice and safe environments are crucial for this. And for this pragmatism to make its way beyond natural skepticism in humans, we must look at social integration, inherent driven conflict that's naturally emerging in human neuroceptive activity as the nexus where ecological perception responses have potential emerge and new awareness. To pass through these levels, human development, we have to have verifiable practices. These are the stages of development. And we have um, the work of G.I. Gurdjieff to bring us through <laughs> intellectual, moving, emotional, work, and I don't have time to summarize, but uh, it will be written out more thoroughly in my full paper. Thank you very much.
Center for Historical Science and Technology at the New University of Lisbon. And I'm going to present a short discussion about the usefulness of integrative medicine in contemporary society. The main purpose of integrative medicine is to see the connection between Eastern medicine, particular Ayurveda, with Western or conventional medicine. The main implication is to go number three of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations 2030 Agenda. Uh, it says to ensure healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. Now we are going to see the background of integrative medicine, the historical roots. The historical roots of Ayurveda, Ayurveda's primitive medicine, are the history of Atharva Veda, Sankhya philosophy, Saraka Sanghita and Sushruta Sanghita, on the other hand, we have the historical roots of conventional medicine, which is a curative medicine. We have the Hippocrates and Galen medicine, some contributions from Arabic medicine, the Cartesian dualism and mechanicism between the mind and the body, and some experiments performed in the brain area. Let's start with the story of Ayurveda. This is just an overview. The only books of India, the Vedas, particularly the Tarma Veda, the last one, claims that the human being is made of soul, mind and body. The soul as a life and a conscious aspect. Some diseases of the human body are manifestation of a wrong state of the conscious mind. This is designated by karma, for example, in Sankhya philosophy. Not only, but also in Sankhya philosophy. They are in Veda, Ayur means life and Veda science from Sanskrit, which is described in the textbooks designated by Saraka Sanghita and Sushruta Sanghita. It's a kind of mind body medicine because the conscious mind plays a relevant role in the process of self healing, which is not relevant in conventional medicine. In this regard, Ayurveda, in Ayurveda, the analysis of mind body relationship is made through the doshas. There are three main doshas, but the uh, and Vita and 50 sub doshas. In Ayurveda, the process of healing is performed in dif different dimensions of human nature. This is described in Bhashakosa theory, we will see it later. Some theories <coughs> support Ayurveda and mind body medicine. The first is the holographic mind theory. This is described by Carl Freeman, a physician, and David Bohm, a physic. This really claims that the mind, our thoughts, our feelings, is a holographic mind. The brain converts the holographic mind into space-time reality. Moreover, Emilio Schwab proposed that our mind, our thoughts, our feelings might be described as quantum waves of possibility. The observation of the subject or the choice, this is called by collapse of wave function, leads to the manifestation of, of holographic mind, namely the disease of the air. This means that the, the disease of the air are together inside us. This is the unification of the subject and the object through the action of the eye in third, described by Passera Nicolescu. At last, we have the mind brain theory. Uh, described by Stuart Amarov, a physician, as you know, and Roger Penhoff, a scientist. This theory states that the quantum component of the mind is responsible for the change of the part of behavior that causes the disease, while the classic component is responsible for the maintenance of the health. The question causes theory, question means five, causes is the plants. There are five plants. Sometimes it could be a seven, and I could explain why, but this is the, the, the same thing. And then it's the physical body, our bones, and so on. But then it's the vital energetic, our will, our blood, and so on. Man, then it's the mind, the thoughts, feelings. This is why sometimes it could be a seven, because there are the separation and cabinet magnets. Cabinet means desire, and man is the concrete mind. Vision is the intuitive knowledge. And Ananda, Ananda means the bliss, when we have a conscious linkage with our soul. And the Atma, Atma is the real self or the soul. We have a picture, 
the several plans of motion is, and then my quotient, and my quotient, and my quotient, and then my quotient. And, my quotient. and the seven main chakras. Chakras are centers that operate according to our field of consciousness. From the top to the bottom, you have the Sahaja, Ajna, Ishkudna, and the heart, and the heart is the heart chakra, just in the middle, Manipura, Svadhisthana, and Wanda. To do the connection with Western points, I would like to, to show this diagram. Uh, by Robert Assagiol. Robert Assagiol was a psychologist, as you know. The several areas of the human mind. He states that conscience with perception means self-awareness. Conscience without perception means unconscious. So we have one, two, and three. One, two, and three is the personal unconscious. Seven is the collective unconscious. And we have the four. The four is the conscious mind or the field of perception. In five, we have the ego, the personal. I, I am this, I am that, and the, the, the conscious linkage with the soul, the soul is the six, but at least I have just referred to In relation to the story of conventional medicine, this is also an overview. Hippocratic medicine is the man as an organized unit constituted by four fluids, being the healings, a reflection of imbalance among these humors. Gamayan complemented these concepts through the use of medicinal herbs. Therapy medicine was responsible for the emergence of the concept of hospital, the compilation of various medicines, and the development of surgical practice. So these ideas remain unchanged until the, the, the end of the 16th century. And there is as always makes also some, some contributions to the anatomy and the study of the body. In the 17th century, Descartes, a philosopher, proposed a separation of mind and body. The mind is the mind of philosophy and religion, while the body is the mind of science and medicine. The body should be treated as a machine. This is the paradigm of conventional medicine. However, in the 89th and 20th centuries, it occurred some experiments in the brain area that has led to the conclusion that the mind and the body are related between them. This is well described in the book Descartes' Error by Antonio Damasco. We have the, the synthesis, the soul mind, the rest cogitant, the dualism. This is described in the skills that we told, uh, the Descartes, and the human body, the rest tensor, the subject of the religion, philosophy, the only real end is the thought, the famous uh, sentence, I think therefore I am. The human body, the subject of activity, science and medicine, the illness is a disturbance of the components of the human machine. In the roots of mechanicism is describing the, the, the book below. So, I'm going to do a cooperation of the diagnosis and the healing methods. In professional medicine, there are only analysis of the symptoms of the physical body. Testing, perform x-rays. In Eastern medicine, and particularly in Ayurveda, there are the analysis and connection and connection of mental and physical patterns. In Ayurveda, as I've said, there are three doshas and three institutions. In the traditional Chinese medicine, we have the yin and the yang. In relation to the healing methods, in the Western medicine and conventional medicine is performed exclusively in the physical body to chemical drugs with several side effects, surgery uh, and radiation for cancer treatment, while in Western medicine is performed both in mental and physical body to change the mental and physical body the adoption, promote positive thought feelings and healthy diet. To succeed some conclusions, nowadays one main area of research medicine and related science, for example, biotechnology. So it's expected that the human beings will live longer in the future. The question is, if this increase of expectation of life will also correspond to increase the quality of life to the person. This is the beginning of my communication. Goal number three of sustaining the development goals of the United Nations 2030 to ensure healthy lives and promoting well being for all the poor nations. So, what remains to be done in this area of research is to have a program that might describe a model of integrative and transdisciplinary medicine, connection of Ayurveda and conventional medicine, in order to prevent some diseases in a more effective way, not just the poor but also.
also to give some quality of life to the patient, as well as to save many financial resources that are spent on allopathic drugs with several side effects in conventional medicine. In the positive way, there are already a few research pro programs applied to psychiatric and oncologic areas. The latter is called integrative uh, oncology. Just a, a note. Uh, <laughs> the Paul de Tarso, uh, the research field is in oncology, uh, integrative oncology. That's all. Thank you. Using other drugs such as ecstasy, methamphetamine, along with joining new ideas 
about politics, social life, music and art. So she's very pleased to have found friends from all the class with the same idea. During therapy, she told the psychologist that she had long been neglected by her parents, who are too interested in material things. And we can explain what that means. For her and for her friends, drug use and form of rebellion, rebellion against the attitude of the parents. Therefore, she really rejects the attitude of her family. So, if you go deeper with her, she will talk uh, extensively about the ways to acquire, how to prepare, and then grows the type of music which is uh, related to drug use, and we have a study here in Romania, what kind of drugs you use, what kind of uh, uh, music you listen, and how she can assess the quality of the drug. So, now I know more about the quality of the drugs through her intervention. So. But the main conclusion from the first part of this presentation is that Maria believes that she has no problem with drug use. Okay? My parents have other problems, not me. She said, and, and she has rationality, okay, and she explained what. She said, my, my weak grades from school reflect the lack of interest in high school, with which she said that she attends high school only because her parents have this expectation for her. What's the point of going to the high school in Romania? When asked what she would like to do regarding the future, she replied that she had no predefined objective, which is perfectly okay, even for myself, I'm 33, I have no clear object about my future life, okay? And she just wanted to do something with art or music. So being in, in um, not to worry about your future, at 17 years old is not a problem, okay? Hope you agree. So, Maria told us that unlike most other colleagues, she did not bring alcohol, okay? And she stopped consuming ecstasies and meth, which were pretty restful for her weight loss. She's convinced that she can continue to smoke marijuana. And this is important what she said. She said marijuana does not cause addiction, which is a huge debate here in Romania, especially with young people, and should be legalized in Romania. Who agree with that? One, two, okay. Are you smoking marijuana? Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, at first reading, so this case study can provide, uh, I'm not even more who are uh, agree with the legalism of marijuana in Romania from you. So a first reading um, of this case study can provide some of the key ideas for today's discussion. And you had, we had here neurologists, we had medical, we had physicians, we had... So one, a new culture of drug that shows drugs in a very positive way, okay, it's trendy to use drugs, has a much greater direct social influence that what balance says and what school says, even the psychologists. So you, you don't enter in a conflict with the, uh, the kids. Two, many of the central values of the illicit drug culture involve the rejection of the social, uh, political, society, and cultural value, and even the family values. Okay, she don't want to go to school. Why should I go to school? Or, Look, how many academics here? They have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, they have two more slides. Uh, look how many academics here who have a bad salary, okay? Look, we have people in the European Parliament from Romania who had no higher education. It's possible, okay? George Bercani. Third, the relationship between drugs and mass culture is not one way. So the culture of drugs have an effect on mass culture and tradition, especially to our music, arts and literature. Fourth, consumers adopt the normality of the deviant group which lead to innovation in, in, in drug using, in drug solution, and also they have unsuccessful abstinence attempts. And fifth, a major change in drug culture in recent years is the development of internet communities, which is really, really dangerous and we can also do some very much about this. Regarding drug use, they include information on on the use, production and so uh, sale of drugs. You go online to have some information and you enter in this kind of discussion and groups and you get new ideas about new drugs, how to use and they and you can get from, from Romanian mail straight to your door. So drug use, in simple words saying, is more than a medical and psychological phenomenon. It's a social, anthropological, economical, political and cultural phenomenon. It's been war. This is why it needs to be approached from a transdisciplinary perspective in order to have a proper and clear understanding of the problem. One single explanation 
one single approach, even when it's from a psychological point of view, it's insu insufficient, incomplete, and wrong. In this transdisciplinary world, physicians and psychologists have taken into account the culture to which the user belongs. We had a, a, a lot of explanation from uh, neurochemistry in the brain, genetics. We had also uh, the family influence, you know, you know exactly what's happening in the family. We have also a peer group, how, how uh, your colleagues, one minute, okay? But also we have social media influence. Uh, so a teenage have a sixteen fold higher risk to smoke if the family starts smoke, just to be aware. And if smoking occurs in 75 of the movies they watch. Final slide. Psychiatrists often have the wrong tendency to look at cases which poorly individual and clinical characteristics. Okay, you are you are dependent, okay, let's give you some case. But drugs of course in a family, you know, including the social environment, here in Cluj, not in Bucharest, in Budapest, the national geographic and has multiple meanings for each age. Ignoring this aspect is also a mistake in the therapeutic approach. Finally, one of the major change that has occurred in drug culture in recent years is the development of internet communities organized around drug use, to which specialists must provide the prompt responsible, maybe by developing new tools and new apps. So Maria was lucky that she came to the psychology, but I think nine out of ten young people who are using drugs they have and they have no major clinical problems, they don't show you to your office, okay? And my last, last slide is drug use, understanding and treatment requires a truly transparent approach. Thank you very much.
of ancestral cultural memory related to the cultivation of the milpa that contained heterogeneous elements such as corn, beans, chili, squash, and other food items, which constitute a heterogeneous homogeneous system. Semiotic discursive model for recovery of the identity of Mexican foods. This model articulates three great truths. The first, women and men possessing empirical knowledge. Second, women and men possessing academic hegemonic knowledge. Signals of system competencies, cultural, linguistic, environmental, social, historical, political, scientific, technological discourse. The third group, women and men possessing technical knowledge, signals of system competencies, cultural, linguistic, environmental, social, historical, ethno-cultural discourse of the existence alternative. Recursive loop, production of meaning. All oh, this is the great system, the same I was here. <coughs> Women, men possessing empirical knowledge. No more things, alternative communication based on the resistance of the indigenous people that pushes them to a process of re-existence that implies the recognition of cultural diversity and difference from an alternative proposal of interculturalizing human society as a decolonial project. The native people respect their rights and rituals. Their thinking is complexly articulated with the labors of the land and religious beliefs. Because of that, these people organize themselves in stewardships. Second group, women men possessing academic hegemonic knowledge. Academic working together with amaranth producers in Chinampega Zone. The participative organization civil society establishes a dialogue city among the three components, where cultural spaces are respected and therefore opens up to a multiple discourse because they start from different positions. The institutional ones, academic and hegemonic knowledge, those of the producers, empirical knowledge, and those of the technicians relationship of academic and empirical knowledge. Third group, women, men, possessors of technical knowledge. Students learning the techniques of sewing by the producers. by the technician's knowledge and experience. Conclusions. In the tripartite relationship, symmetrical and asymmetric relationships are not denied. They are mutually recognized and complementary in relation to re-existence and alternative the producers of the indigenous people are recognized in their social, cultural, agricultural, historical, political, economic, and environmental practices. In this communication, there is a transculturization of knowledge that transits in the language from the academic center hegemonic to the peripheral or exteriority of the other. That is to say, the products of various types of food 
including the technician trained to. At the same time, train the producers in this to achieve the transfer of technology without overlooking the knowledge of the customs, the ways of life of the other. This is achieved not only an alternative participative communication and other name, but also a communication for another development. Yes, I'll talk to you. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. 